Hey, you're listening to Clumsy Theosis, a Catholic podcast that explores topics within the Catholic faith to help us deepen our spiritual lives, own our relationship with the Lord, and strengthen His church. Hey, what's up? My name is Rochelle Lucero, and you have tuned in to the Clumsy Theosis podcast. I want to welcome you this week and let you know that we're in the middle of a series on salvation history. This week, we're going to be covering Noah. And let me tell you, there's so much more to Noah's story than this cutesy little children's, almost like a fairy tale story about him bringing the animals into the ark two by two and this beautiful rainbow appearing in the sky after the flood. Yes, that is part of Noah's story, but there's so much more. And we're going to dive into that today. And I think it will be relationship changing, I'm hoping, between you and the Lord, because for me, it definitely was when I really got into the details of Noah's story and his role as a mediator in salvation history. I do want to reiterate something from last week when we spoke about Adam. When we were talking about his pre-sin condition, we were focusing on him and his role as priest, prophet, king, and bridegroom. Right now, these were all the roles that he undertook because he was a son of God. And I don't know that I drilled that in enough last week, him being a son of God, and that's why he was a priest, prophet, king, and bridegroom. So I do want to point that out again right now and just really hit it home and remind you that when God created man, that, you know, what did he say? He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Now, this is the language of sonship. And we know this for sure because later on, When Adam has his own children, when he has his son, Seth, in particular, the same language is used, image and likeness. So just as Seth was the son of Adam, Adam is also the son of God. Now, I bring this up because this is incredibly important to us today, because in our journey of theosis, we are being transformed into God's glory, which is his image and his likeness. And his image and his likeness, as we know from Adam's priest in condition, is to be a priest, prophet, king, and bridegroom. Okay, so if you have not listened to that episode, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it. The title was really long, I know. It was The Bible, Salvation, History, Adam, and Being a Child of God, Part 2. This is the point in the show where we raise a metaphorical glass and thank our most recent donors. And this week we're thanking Laura Newman for becoming a donor because Clumsy Theosis is 100% listener supported and we value all of our donation, all of our support from all of our listeners. If you would like to be a donor because you have found that this show has been of help to you in any way, shape, or form, please go to clumsytheosis.net and click the word donate in the menu. All right, moving on to Noah. We are going to talk about Noah. We also are going to talk about the difference between a covenant and a contract, and we're going to show how the covenant that God made with Noah is a redemptive renewal of the covenant that he had originally made with Adam that failed, right? So let's start with the basics of Noah. Why was there a flood in the first place? Let's ask the big questions. Well, in Genesis 6 verse 5, we read that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay, that's kind of big. Now, how did that come about? What happened? What was going on in the world? Well, for that, we have to go back and look at Adam and his children. Now, if you remember, Adam had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain murdered his brother in cold blood and really was not repentant about it at all. All right, Adam went on to have a third son, his son, Seth. Now, Seth was said to be in the image and likeness of Adam. Right. So, yes, he's his son, but there's also a bit of righteousness about Seth. Cain had descendants, which kind of took after him. And um, they're referred to in Scripture as the daughters of man. So if you ever read that and you're confused, you're like, what does that mean? Okay, they are descendants of Cain. And we know Cain murdered his brother. Okay, don't let those two things separate in your mind. (laughs) Now, Seth, he had descendants and his descendants are referred to as sons of God in Scripture. Okay, so the sons of God eventually started marrying the daughters of man, and they started marrying a lot of them. Enter polygamy into the scene of the earth. Okay, polygamy is always bad in scripture. Whenever it happens, there's always retribution that follows. 
things just go awry. Society just gets messed up. And that's what happens. Okay, we have a bunch of children who are not being properly fathered because their fathers are too busy having additional children with multiple wives. All right. And the land is just murderous and violent. So the flood comes. God chooses Noah. But why? Why does he choose Noah? Well, Paul tells us when he writes his letter to the Hebrews, he says that Noah is considered a preacher of righteousness in this land of evil. Noah is considered righteous, so God chooses him. He's building the ark, and while he's building the ark, Noah is rebuking his neighbors, okay? Now, this is not just pure condemnation and judgment that he's spewing out upon his neighbors. You can imagine from a righteous person, with his rebuke of their way of life, he's also inviting them to repent, right? Because if they repent, they change their their ways, they can come aboard the ark and be saved as well. We know, though, that no one else comes aboard. It's just Noah and his family. So everyone who was killed in the flood chose their fate. And this fact right here was game changing for me, especially when I would look at this story of Noah and the flood. I thought that God was overreacting. I thought that he was being cold hearted. I thought that there was no room for second chances, that you just put a toe out of line and that's it. You're smited from the earth by God. Okay, that's not true at all, especially when you read this story. Okay, so this is what started to really change my outlook about God in the Old Testament. There's going to be more stuff I'm going to talk about in this episode that will also corroborate that fact. So let's move on to those. So the flood comes and Noah is aboard his ark, which is filled with plants and animals. Let's not forget the plants. That's really important because when we step back and look at this, we can see how the ark resembles the Garden of Eden, right? So the ark is like a floating Eden, okay? And then after 150 days of being on the water, the flood ends, the ark lands, and Noah gets out and the first thing he does is build an altar and burn a sacrifice to God. All right, so we know that Eden is referred to as the primordial sanctuary, the original temple, and Noah comes out and he burns an offering, which is what? A priestly duty, right? And priests belong in a temple. Okay, so this act moves God's heart. And and this is a little, a little tidbit, which I really appreciate. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it was because Adam did not perform his role as a priest, which was to till and to keep, which we also know is to serve and to guard. Okay, so he failed as a priest. The first thing Noah comes out of the ark and does is a priestly duty. Okay, so it's moving God's heart and God decides that he wants to make another covenant with man through Noah. All right. And so the covenant is in Genesis 9. It's very short. It's half a page in my Bible. So please read it and actually start in Genesis 8 with, I think it's verse 20, because that's when God gives the promise to Noah. That's when you read about the rainbow and how God will never destroy the earth with a flood again and all that. So start with Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, and then read through chapter 9, because that's the covenant. And when you read the covenant, there's going to be some details in there that are just going to raise a few question marks, but I'm going to explain to you what those little details mean and how they make perfect sense, especially when you understand that God is redeeming the covenant that he made with Adam um, and renewing it with Noah. All right. So stay tuned for that. You will enjoy them. But first, I think it's really important that we really and truly and deeply know what a covenant is that is ingrained in our bones. So here's a pared down definition of a covenant and you don't need to write it down because it's in the show notes, okay? A covenant is a sacred bond between two parties that makes them family by means of swearing an oath. In every covenant, there are conditions, which is what you expect from the other parties involved, as well as a self curse if you break the covenant. All right, now, I think that's understandable, but let's flesh it out some more by comparing it to a contract because a lot of people confuse the two. So I'm going to look at how you initiate a covenant and a contract as well as how they're carried out, what motivates someone to create one, and how long do they last, okay? So first, an example of a contract would be if you're buying or selling something or if you're employing someone or you're being employed. An example of a covenant is marriage and adoption, 
Okay, we're going to get back to that, but just hold tight. All right, so how do you start a contract? How is it initiated? Well, you exchange promises with someone and you secure benefits. If, you know, the other person breaks the contract, they owe you money or whatever it is, right? And then you sign the contract, which you are invoking your own name. And that's the strength of the contract, right? Is by your name and how good your name and your word are, all right? Whereas a covenant is initiated by swearing an oath, okay? An oath is stronger than a promise. Instead of securing benefits, you are invoking a conditional self-curse on yourself, which is stronger, right, by far. And instead of invoking human names to seal the contract with a covenant, you're invoking God's name to seal your covenant, which is all-powerful, All right, so right there, we can tell this is going to be totally different. So how do you carry out a contract? Like, how is it applied to life? You exchange properties, goods, and services, right? You're basically saying, that is yours, this is mine, we will exchange them, and this exchange is only limited to what is outlined in the contract. Whereas with a covenant, you're exchanging a life for a life. You're exchanging your own life for their own life. You're saying, I am yours and you are mine. Okay, and I know that sounds familiar because we hear that in scripture frequently, right? God is telling us, I am yours and you are mine. And because you're exchanging life, there's no limit to the covenant exchange, right? Because you're giving the totality of yourself, right? So there's no limits. It's all of you for, and we're going to see the duration of a covenant, all right, in a moment. So what would motivate someone to create a contract? Usually it's because of profit or self-interest, right? You want to protect your interests or you want to profit for something, right? Whereas a covenant, the motivation behind it is self-giving loyalty and sacrificial love, all right? Totally different, totally different. And then with regard to the duration, a contract is only temporary. It only lasts as long as stipulated in the contract, whereas a covenant it lasts forever. A covenant is permanent. Not only is it permanent, it's intergenerational. All right. So you can see the difference between a contract versus a covenant. And when I gave those examples before I went into this comparison, and I mentioned that marriage and adoption are perfect examples of a covenant. All right. When you marry someone, when you adopt someone, you bring them into your family, okay? And that's what God does every time he makes a covenant with humanity. He brings us into his family. And with every covenant we're going to see, and we'll talk about in more detail next week, he is broadening the net and widening his family. And not just any, you know, random, dysfunctional, screwed up family. No, a family that is based on self-sacrificial love and loyalty, especially on God's part. Some people will say, uh, particularly you'll find this in Protestant circles, that the first covenant that God makes with humanity is with Noah, because when he makes, uh, when he starts his um, promise with Noah, he says, behold, I make a covenant with you and your descendants. That's the first time we hear God say those words. So people don't realize that he had actually already made a covenant with Adam. But we know that for a few reasons. The first cue for that is when he starts to make his covenant with Noah, He says, be fruitful and multiply. And we know, most people know, that this is something that God says to Adam, okay? And when there's a repetition of phrase like that, it is usually 99.7% of the time on purpose, right? It is because we're supposed to think about the thing it reminds us of. And so we're supposed to think about Adam and the covenant that God made with him. Before God lays out the conditions of the covenant with Noah, he gives him his promise. And that's in Genesis chapter 8, starting with verse 20. All right. So in verse 21, this is what God says. And listen to the inflection in my voice here. All right. God says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done while the earth remains Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Okay? If you noticed, the inflection that I gave there was when God says, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So God is acknowledging that something is different now between 
humanity today versus humanity when he created Adam and Eve, which primarily means that sin has entered the world as well as, you know, and because sin has entered the world, evil is in the world, violence is in the world, fear is in the world. And we're going to see that represented in the conditions of this covenant that he makes with Noah, especially when we compare it to what he did with Adam. Right. So we're going to be tapping into the priest, prophet, and king roles that we covered in our last episode regarding Adam because they're going to apply to this covenant, but with adjustments. Okay. Remember that. One of the first things that we notice in the covenant with Noah, we see a change in diet. God is saying, now you can eat the flesh of animals, but there's going to be restrictions regarding, you know, nothing with blood and so on. Okay. But we're also going to see that now there's going to be fear between animals and men because now the diet has changed. Okay. This is an adjustment from what we see in Adam's covenant with God because this is part of the priestly duty of tilling and keeping or serving and guarding, gardening, <laughs> serving and guarding. Um, so as a priest, Noah, yes, he has this role, but it's it's different from what Adam had to do because now there's sin in the world. All right. We also notice that God says that there's going to be an account needing to be made for all the bloodshed on the earth. And that is for animals as well as for man. So, and not only is there going to be an account, there's also going to be retribution to be made for all of this bloodshed, which implies that there's going to be some sort of maybe capital punishment involved in order to keep man in check. Right. So, Noah is administering justice now. That is now his role as, as a ruler, right? Where Adam was a king and he just had dominion over all of the earth. Nothing in his dominion required any sort of um, need for administering justice. But now that is necessary because of sin. All right. And because of this, because Noah's going to be administering justice, he's going to have to act like a judge in some sense, right? He's going to have to pronounce punishments and whatnot. So this shows an adjustment to the prophetic role that Adam played when um, as a prophet, you speak on God's behalf. Adam, he spoke on God's behalf by naming animals. Now Noah is speaking on God's behalf with the pronouncement of punishments and acting as a judge. And we know that because there are previous stories in scripture, for example, when Cain kills his brother Abel or when Lambeth commits murder, it is God's prerogative to judge these scenarios and to you know decide on punishment. That is not man's prerogative. But now that has been passed on to Noah. So he's speaking on God's behalf. But if you look at the difference between like what Adam was doing and what Noah was doing, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be naming plants and animals instead of pronouncing judgments all among people, right? Just saying. So you can see these adjustments, they're kind of like downgrades from the original covenant. But that's not because that's how God wants it. That's because sin has entered man's heart. God is aware of that. And he's working with man where man is. Okay. Like I said, this story of Noah and like knowing these details and how God is redeeming his covenant with Adam, but he has to make adjustments to it. It really changed my perspective about the God of the Old Testament because for one, it showed me that he wants man to be a part of his family. No matter how bad they screw up, he just wants them to be a part of his family. Also that he's going to work with man wherever man is. And that applies to us even today. No matter how bad you've sinned, no matter how long you've been sinning, no matter how long you commit the same sin over and over and you should know better, God is still going to work with you where you're at as long as you are willing to work with him as well and to surrender and to be humble. And I also remember thinking, you know, that God in the Old Testament seemed to lose his temper all the time. He seemed to be angry and full of rage and just quick to punish. And I was just like, man, the God of the Old Testament is not someone that I want to tango with, let alone know. Like, that's just scary business. But really, you know, looking at this story of Noah, we you will realize that this is a blueprint for the rest of what we're going to see in the Old Testament, which is God reaches out. He condescends. He comes down to man and says, I want you to be part of my family no matter what you've done. I recognize your sinfulness and I'm going to work with you where you're at. But because of your sinfulness, your abilities are lessened. 
adjustments are going to need to be made to these covenants and rules are going to be added. Oh my gosh, so many rules we're going to see with the covenant with Moses. But that's not because God wants to make things difficult. It's because he knows that those things are going to help us to grow and to mature in in our in our spirituality and to be able to combat sin better, right? That is his overarching goal for us to be transformed into his glory, into his image and likeness you know, to become true sons and daughters, right? And this has been going on since the first fall. All right, so I'm really stoked. I hope you're stoked. Um, Next week, we're gonna cover the fall of Noah. It's a little sorted, so I didn't wanna end on that type of a low note, Uh, but we're gonna get into that next week as well as Abraham. And if there's time, I want to talk about how God is expanding his family with every covenant that he makes. But we might not have time. I'm not sure because I know like with the covenant with Abraham, it takes part in three different settings. So there's lots to talk about. We'll see. We'll see how we fare next week. All right. If you are not signed up to receive my weekly email, which gives you the weekly episode as well as updates about what's going on. And sometimes I give you freebies. If you're not signed up for that, I suggest you do that now. You can go to clumsytheosis.net and sign up there, or you can go down to the show notes and click the link. Now that you've listened to this episode, go and read your Bible, chapter 9 in Genesis. Actually, start chapter 8, verse 20, and you can read about all of this lovely stuff. And and not only read about it, but it can now become part of your relationship with the Lord, right? It is going to be yours. You're going to own it, and you guys are going to grow closer and in more intimacy. All right. Until next week, everyone, peace out. Thank you for tuning in to Clumsy Theosis. I'm so happy that you've been able to hang out. If you want to learn more about Clumsy Theosis, you are more than welcome to visit my website, clumsytheosis.net. From clumsytheosis.net, you will also be able to contact me if you're interested in booking me as a speaker or if you're just feeling generous and you'd like to make a donation. Remember that together we can transform the world by letting the Lord transform us.